I'd like you to consider four concepts with me for over the next few minutes. Leadership, Grandpa, Hakuna Matata, and a man called Rock. You see, leadership for me is not something you can buy or read about. Leadership happens when a human being transcends his or herself and goes within to reach those depths, those heights of the essence of what it is to be human. At that level, one is close to what we call human potential. From that level, there exudes a magnanimity from one human being to another and beyond. It is that energy, that vibration from that level that triggers in another an uprising of energy to become inspired to take ownership and become motivated to do something. It all started for me when I was a young boy growing up on the island of Mombasa in Kenya. I used to walk up and down Kilindini Road with my grandpa, and grandpa would always stop and talk to one particular person. And it wasn't just a casual hello. He would spend a fair bit of time, and grandpa would do this every day with this particular individual, and by all accounts for a few years. This person he talked to was what society called a beggar. And the Swahili term for beggar is maskini yamungu. And maskini sat just about there in front of that shop front. And he slept there four nights a week before he would return to his village and come back. Maskini was born a victim of polio and would never have use of his legs for the rest of his life. But Grandpa was determined that he saw a human being there. And Grandpa would encourage and question. Grandpa's technique was questioning to arise the awareness within Maskini that he was a human being first. Grandpa also would question him that for whatever decisions Maskini would make, he would have to own it. He would have to take responsibility, not doing what other people said. And then Grandpa always checked, well, once you've decided what you want to do, do you know what you need, not what other people tell you? Now, Grandpa would do this for a long time, and uh, Maskini was definitely fairly relaxed in Grandpa's uh, company. And even though some of the questions to us could be confronting or we might be afraid to ask, Maskini's response most of the time was Hakuna Matata. Now, in Australia, Hakuna Matata translates as no worries, mate. In, in the UK, it's no problem, stiff up a little. In the States, it's no issue. Hakuna Matata is all of that and more. Hakuna Matata is actually the sense of calming the turbulence. Hakuna, there is no matata, troubling. Okay? Now, when you have the attitude of Hakuna Matata, you actually shift your perspective, your paradigm is shifted. And the noise is settled so that you can see things clearly. What a beautiful philosophy in the African language. So Grandpa would visit Maskini every day and actually help him out financially, but not by giving him things. Grandpa would buy him books. Sometimes I would lend my school books, and as did my siblings, to teach him reading, writing. And he developed a small business of selling newspapers, the Daily Nation it was then. And part of the test was that Grandpa would go every day and ask Maskini, so what's the headlines for today? And Maskini had to read them, understand them, recite them back without looking at the newspaper. And then as an added bonus, 
grandpa would give him the money for about three or four newspapers as bonus, but wouldn't take the newspaper. Now, it just so happened that one day, grandpa said to me, he was due to take retirement. And at that time, retirement in Kenya meant no pension, no superannuation, no social security. You survived by the savings or your wits of taking another job. And he was concerned to explore with Maschini what Maschini could do next to sustain that living. So we approached Maschini and we posed the question. And Maschini just calmly took it all calmly. Hakuna Matata. So Grandpa said, okay, so what are you going to do? He said, I would like to start a business cleaning other shop fronts on Kilindini Road. Buana Muse, that's what he called Grandpa. Buana is Mr. Muse is wise elder. Right? And it's quite an accolade to be called that. Buana Muse, will you help me talk to the other shopkeepers? Grandpa said, no. I was a bit stunned. Just at that time, the shopkeeper came out to greet Grandpa. And Grandpa, cool as a cucumber. Good morning, Ibrahim. Have you heard of Maskini's new business idea? And we all looked at Maskini. And Maskini said, I would like to start a business cleaning shop fronts. Wana, will you please help me talk to the other shopkeepers for me? Shopkeeper said, no. I was about 10 years old then, and I'm thinking, come on, help the man, he's a good man. Ask, he's asking for help. And the shopkeeper said, I'll tell you what I'll do, though. For the past few years, you've been keeping this shop front cleaner than any on Kalindini Road. And the fact that you sleep in the shop front for four nights a week, that's added security for me. I like it. So what I'll do is I'll write a reference letter that you can take to the shops and see if they'll give you a try. So Grandpa and I went along our way, and a couple of hours later, we were coming back the same way. And Maskini was not where he normally sat. I got a bit worried. We looked, and in the distance, there was Maskini almost as though he was on a spring. You know, he was jumping up and down, waving his arms. I was curious at first, and then I got excited. And I looked to Grandpa for permission to increase our pace. Not Grandpa. He decided to wear his cloak of Hakuna Matata. And only this time, he began humming a tune. I called it his humming tune. He maintained his pace, and we walked to Maschini. And Maschini was hopping towards us. As we got closer, Maschini grabbed Grandpa's feet and said, Buona Muse, Buona Muse, you won't believe it. I talked to 20 shops, and all 20 said, they're going to give me a try for one month. And he said, Buona Muse, at the end of one month, you do not have to give me anything. I would like to buy you a cup of chai and two mahamaris. Mahamaris is a street food, sweet bread. Don't want to talk about it, makes my mouth water. <laughs> <laughs> and Grandpa now released his emotions and he said, That is fantastic, Maskini. Are you sure you want to do this? Maskini said, Yes. I've been wanting and thinking about this for a while, and I think the time is right for me to do it now. And then Grandpa said, okay, so what do you need to do in order to do this business? And he said, when he was in pensive mode, Maschini did that. I need a bucket. I need two brooms, a short-handled one and a long-handled one. And I need some rags. And Grandpa said, and at home I have a spare shirt. I'll give you a spare shirt. Maschini thought, great, new shirt for a new business. And then Grandpa said, so what exactly are you going to do? And Maschini said, well, I'm here four nights a week. After the lunchtime rush, when everybody has gone home for their siesta, I'll go and check the shops. And if there's any takataka, which is rubbish, and then he reminded, oh, and I'll need a takataka bag. I'll take it away. And then in the evening, when everybody has gone home and the streets are quiet, I'll go again to do a final check. And early in the morning, I will get up and clean all the shops. I must have been so excited by this prospect. When I got home, I told Dad and Mom what had happened. And Dad said, you know what? I have a spare broom, and it's a long-handled one. Maybe Maschini could use it. And Mom heard that, and she said, I've got a bag of old clothes. Perhaps he can use that. 
as rags. And dad said, would you like to take that to him now? I said, yes. He said, hop into the car, son. Let's go. He took me to Moschini. As I got out of the car, Moschini recognized me and gave me such a warm welcome. If only I realized then the impact of the experience that Grandpa and Moschini had on my life for the rest of my life. Let's wind the calendar forward a little bit. I've got up here a life transformed because I wanted to influence you in a transformation in the making. A few years later, Maschini not only retained those 20 shops, he had expanded his empire to something over 50, but he was employing people and he employed handicapped and disabled people. And those that could stand up, he got them to clean the windows and dust the cobwebs. Right? And now he was cleaning shop fronts, he was cleaning windows, and he was cleaning the pavement between the shops and the road, and Kilindini Road. And so now, Maschini was motoring. He was on his own feet, as it were. And he invited Grandpa to the village where he lived. And Grandpa took me along. When I got there, we were introduced to Maschini's wife and three children. And they were living in a house that they built. With Maschini on the ground, he would shape the mud bricks and dry them in the sun and then stack them when they were dried. And he and his wife would thatch the palm leaves of the date palm, coconut trees, to create the roof. And they were already planning a small extension. Now that to me, ladies and gentlemen, is a life transformed. And the life was transformed because the individual himself welled up with enough inspiration, stimulated by one magnanimous soul, to be motivated to get up and do something for himself. In 1968, I had just finished school. Grandpa passed away. And five months later, with my family, I moved to the UK, where I spent the next 25 years. So that's mum and dad. Grandpa was mum's dad. And that's me to the right, top right when, at 17, I was still growing hair. <laughs> then I moved in 1993 to live in Perth in Western Australia. And very soon I was introdu introduced to a man called Rock. Now, by absolute coincidence, Rock did his early growing up and his early married life in Mombasa, Kenya. I didn't know him, but he remembered me and my siblings as part of the church community. But I don't know what it was, whether it was Rock's love of tools, as I had a love of tools, or our interest in DIY. We, we didn't have any training in any particular skill, but we'd love to have a goal. You know, if something was broken, we'll have a goal. You know? And if we couldn't fix it, well, our explanation was, you have to dissect something before you can understand how it works. <laughs> But such was the relationship. Rock regarded me as a bit of a trusted advisor. He was old enough to, to be my father. And he would phone me periodically. I'd later moved to Melbourne. And uh, Rock still phoned me whenever there was a problem to just talk it through. He liked the way I diagnose and ask questions, which was really Grandpa's influence. So one day he phoned me and I normally write the date, the name of the person calling, the topic. And Rock would do the same. And Rock was a brilliant, diligent student. He would always follow through. And if he didn't understand something later, he would call me and said, don't understand. And he said, Joseph, my garage door won't close anymore. Can you help me? He's in Perth, I'm in Melbourne. I said, Hakuna Matata. <laughs> because we, we were familiar with uh, Swahili. And uh, so I started by asking him questions. So tell me what's happening. He said, well, Last, up to the last week it worked, but this week the bolts are not aligned and I can't lock it. So I would ask questions. Has somebody bumped into the garage? Has the hinge fallen off? Has the door rotten away? I'd ask lots of questions. And he would periodically run out to the garage because he didn't have the answer and then come back and tell me, oh, yeah, yeah. That's fixed. And then I would ask another question. He would go back out again 
phone there, come back and tell me. In those down times, as one does, one doodles, doesn't one? So I was doodling. And I decided to write Rock's name as a mind map. I don't know why. I don't know what possessed me. But as soon as I'd done that, I had an amazing flash and aha moment. And in Rock's name, I saw Grandpa's system and process. You see, what Grandpa would do when faced with any issue, he'd say, what's really happening now? What do you think is happening? So for me, R stood for reality. You know, what's the reality check? What's really going on here? And then Grandpa always said, and there's always something you can do. And even when you think you've thought of everything, there's something you can do. Well, I like the word, the letter O and the word options. Right? And Grandpa would say, don't just look at the options in front of you. Consider what's in the marginals. Tolerate the marginals, he would say. And then he would say, and don't forget what's behind you. And if you can't turn around, ask somebody. Because one of the things that also comes through from wisdom tradition is the first step into solving a problem is to accept you've got the problem. How many of us are in denial mode? I didn't do it. Her fault, his fault. But when you accept the problem, there is a humility that comes with it, and you're open to options. But then also Grandpa would say, now, are you sure you want this option? Are you sure? And behind those words were, are you just saying it because you want me to hear it? Or do you really mean it? Right? For me, that instantly struck a rapport prompted by the letter Q as quest. Quest is when you've got the congruence of head and heart. Right? Not necessarily a balance. Imagine this. If you've rationalized and your head is saying, I've got to do this, but your heart's not in it, chances of success are tainted. And if you're passionately mad about doing something but haven't logically thought it through, you might miss something along the way. So quest is significant. And you... Grandpa always said, now that you've decided what you're going to do, what do you need? So I was inspired by the letter U to think the unique needs for the particular issue and the particular quest. And then the E was easy. That was part of my corporate experience, the execution strategy. So what exactly are you going to do by when, how much, how big? And how will you hold yourself accountable and to whom? And as we heard from uh, an earlier talk this, this morning, make sure you're measuring the right things. Right? So suddenly, Rock's name became, for me, an acronym. And that became developed as a tool, as an instrument. So now when I meet people, I ask them if they're human beings, then they've got to have relational lives. They're not islands. And in order to sustain their relational lives, they've got to do something. Work, have a career, have a choice. And with Rock, we say, what's going well? And what's happening in your life as a human being? What's happening in your relationship life? What could go better? What should be improved? What's missing? Are you doing all the things you want to do in your professional life? Are you still doing the career you wanted to do? What has changed? And then we go through through the process, what options they have for each of those areas. And then, what is your quest? Congruency of head and heart. And then, what needs do you have to put in place, and what exactly are you going to do to execute? My dream for Rock is that it becomes part of the personal and professional development vocabulary. I told Rock before he passed away in 2005 that one day his name would be helping many people in the world. He looked down humbly and said, how can that be? I don't know much. I think he'd be tickled to know that there are a few thousand people in the world today, in all the continents, actually using the rock model to help make those decisions. So, I ask you, will you invite rock into your lives 
as a friend to help you through some of those decisions in your life as a human being, in your relationship life, and in your professional life. The Swahili word for thank you very much is asante sana. So from me to you all, asante sana.